So I'm, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Andrew now, who is going to be uh, running the, the, the presentation. Um, so uh, Andrew, take it away. So uh, again, good evening, everybody. Uh, and thank you for, for joining us on this session. I'm just going to try and share screen with the presentation on. And I'm hoping now that everybody can see um, the first of a PowerPoint series of slides that's got a picture of a group of people riding bikes on a seaside promenade with a sunset. Um, if you can't see that, um, can you put into chat that you can't see it or yes, thumbs up. That's a really good one. Those of you who can use the um, thumbs up symbol, that's brilliant. So at least and Michelle can see it. So I'm hoping everybody else can. So the presentation we've got here is based on one that we um, we use for a variety of different clients. Um, we use it for uh, professional drivers who are doing um, cycle awareness training or essential cycling skills. Professional drivers, bus drivers, truck drivers have to do um, effectively one day training a year to keep their professional license. Lots of courses they can do, but this um, sort of safe urban driving or essential skills for uh, for drivers around cyclists is very popular because a lot of big infrastructure projects have said that it's compulsory if you want to tender for that big project and this is down to um, large vehicles causing problems for cyclists in London so we've been a way of managing that. Um, we then started running it um, as a project for young drivers, learner drivers and got involved with some driving instructors as part of that and as a result um, we're also running this presentation as CPD for driving instructors. We've had very good feedback from them. Uh, we've had driving instructors say they've learned things and they're changing their lesson plans. And it's also um, information that we um, give to people who are doing cycle trainer courses or cycle ride leader courses. So if anybody's got any questions to start with, um, fire away. Otherwise, I will crack on with the first slide. And Chris, can I, if anybody else comes comes along, can I leave you to to admit them in, and I'll focus on the on the slides. Absolutely, yeah, no problem. Thanks very much. Okay, so here goes. This is the first slide. You may well be familiar with it. It's from the current edition of the Highway Code. It's Rule 163. Um, it's talking about how much space people driving should give vulnerable road users. Fancy term for people it's easy to hurt, people walking, cycling, riding horses. And the wording is a bit ambiguous because it says give at least as much space as you would a car. Well, a lot of people, when they overtake another car, give it a few inches, which is why everybody folds their wing mirrors in these days. So the Department for Transport put this photograph in to make the point that what they meant was imagine there's a car there and overtake the imaginary car. Cross over the centre line, use the other side of the road. Or as one driving instructor I was working with said, he tells his clients, imagine the cyclist falls over, don't run over their heads. Now, obviously, if there's oncoming traffic, then you can't overtake. You need to wait. Um, and it can be that if it's very busy and lots of oncoming traffic, that you need to be really quite patient and wait there for quite a while. So the highway code says if you're in a slow moving vehicle, a bike, a horse, a road sweeper, an underpowered caravan, um, and you have a long queue of vehicles behind you, then you should, when it's safe, pull over and allow them to go by. So that's not immediately somebody comes up behind you, that's if there's a long queue, now long, the highway code doesn't say whether that's time or number of vehicles, that's a judgment call that needs to be made. Um, and it doesn't say get out of the way instantly, it's when there's somewhere safe. Now, as a single cyclist, it's usually fairly easy to find somewhere to pull into. But let's say that we've gone out as a group now and there's a group of us, maybe eight. Finding somewhere for a group of eight cyclists to get out of the way can take a while. You're pretty much talking about finding a lay by or a bus stop or something like that, somewhere where there's, there's a gap. So, again, it might be that the people waiting behind have to be patient. Now, the other thing is if you've got a group riding, what does the highway code say about cyclists riding side by side? Um, thumbs up for yes, that's okay. Thumbs down for no, that's not allowed. Or hand sideways for gosh, I'm really not sure. I should check this. 
Any thoughts? Yeah, we've got some thumbs up coming through. This is good. Yeah. So the highway code says um, you should not ride more than two abreast. So two is absolutely fine. And if you think about it, if you had a group of eight cyclists, that means that the car that's overtaking has got to be on the other side of the road for a very long time. Whereas if they double up, what you've now done is made the group half the length, which means the car that's overtaking has to be on the wrong side of the road for half the amount of time. So when you've got groups of cyclists and they're riding two by two, they're doing it because it's good practice, because it means that it's easier for people to overtake. They only have to borrow the other side of the road for half the amount of time. So that's the overtaking bit. Now let's have a look at where the Department for Transport have put the cyclist in this picture. How close to the curb, whoops, sorry about that. How close to the curb, not the edge of carriageway white marker, but how close to the curb does that look? Anybody want to put a, a note in the chat, the distance there, I think that it might be. And I'm saying that, but I've lost the chat. Here we go. Yeah, um, we're getting people saying sort of 60 centimetres, um, 70 centimetres. I'd say that's roughly about a metre, um, three feet a yard. And that's pretty much the closest you want to be to the curb. Lots of reasons why you want that gap there. You can see there's drain gratings there. Uh, you want to be away from those. If you're lucky, the bars are being laid across. If you're unlucky, they're laid the way you're going, so your wheel gets caught in it and you're airborne. In urban areas, it's where the broken glass builds up. In rural areas, it's where all the thorns are. Um, lots of pedestrians don't really look up to cross the road unless they hear something coming. On a bike, you're pretty much silent. So having that metre space there gives you a space that if somebody steps out in the road, it's, it's an opportunity to avoid them. But the most important reason why you want that meter space there is because it's a safety zone that you can move into if the overtaking vehicle hasn't crossed over the other side of the road but is giving you as much space as they would a car and is overtaking coming by on your elbow so if you've got that meter space there that's the space you can move into to create an extra meter gap between you and that passing vehicle but to know whether the car coming up behind you has crossed over to the side of the road or is coming up on your elbow, you've got to look behind. Every time you hear somebody coming up, check where are they. That's a good. Yep, yeah, that's good. Lovely overtake. Yep, yeah, that's nice. Which is why it's really important if you're getting back into cycling after a while that you spend some time practicing making sure you can look over your shoulder without veering all over the road. Practice in a, an empty car park or a school playground out of the house. Check that next one. Yep, yeah, that's good. Whoa, too close. Move over allow them to go by and then check before moving back out. So this isn't a relaxed style of cycling. This isn't like going to the Isle of Comrie on a, on a nice summer's afternoon and cycling around the almost deserted island, enjoying the birds singing and the waves crashing on the beach. This is constant vigilance, but it's that observation, that vigilance that's helping keeping you safe. Does that all make sense? Thumbs up if everybody's good with that and we can move on. Oh, sorry. Okay, right. So next slide. So here we've got a cycle lane um, and we've got a large goods vehicle. Now, the thing to remember about these cycle lanes is you still need to be checking what's going on behind you. That's just paint. It's not a force field. And every time you hear somebody coming up, check to make sure that they're not um veering into your to your space you still need to have that meter gap next to you to be able to move into or if they veered in too far to bail out completely so again even if you're in a cycle lane still keep checking behind and as a driver if i'm driving along here i'm thinking back to that first picture and imagining well i want to be far enough away that if that cyclist falls over i don't run them over so that might mean that i've still got to cross over the center line so if there's oncoming traffic i might still need to wait but that first slide gave us the best clue as to how far away we should be and that's how far away just because a highways officer has painted a cycle lane a meter out it doesn't mean that as drivers we can drive up against that brushing cyclists on their elbow
And yeah, Paul makes a really good point. Cycle lanes give people a false sense of security. The, the Department for Transport guidance is that cycle lanes should be two meters wide. Now, if you can find one that's that wide, I'd love to know where it is. Because exactly this reason, they recognize that cycle lane, people are used to driving in lanes. They do it on dual carriageways. So, I'm in my lane, you're in your lane, everything's good. But by making them excessively narrow, less than the design guidance, it just encourages drivers to drive past on your elbow. So it's a known issue with cycle lanes, but unfortunately there are many that have been painted way below the design guidance of two metres. So as a cyclist, just because you're in a cycle lane, don't relax, keep checking and be ready to bail out if you need to. And as a driver, and you see somebody in a cycle lane like this, I will, this is coming up Causeway Head Road, I'll slow down, I'll wait till there's no oncoming traffic, and then I'll move over as if I was overtaking a cyclist without the white paint there. It's just paint, it's not a force field. Now this is a very common feature. Uh, we see these all over the place, traffic island there to make life easier for pedestrians, and I'm all for making life easier for pedestrians, but clearly there's not space for somebody in a motor vehicle to overtake somebody riding a bike in that gap and give them the space that we saw in that first slide. Imagine the, the, the islands in the middle of the road, the driver's just gonna drive over it. Hence, in this circumstance, they've got a, a sign saying, caution, do not overtake cyclists at the islands. Now this photograph is taken by the fourth road bridge. You can see the girders there. The only other place I know of that sign is uh, by Musselburgh Racecourse. But there are thousands of these traffic islands. Now. The best practice guidance as a driver is if you see a cyclist in this space, do not overtake them, wait behind. The best practice guidance for cyclists is not to ride that metre out position, but to move to the centre of the lane. Not the middle of the road, but the centre of the lane in order to discourage somebody from overtaking you at a place where there isn't space for a safe overtake. Now, obviously, you don't want to just be riding along, see the traffic island and drift out to the centre of the lane because following traffic's probably going to get you. So it's a matter of looking as far up the road as you can, seeing the traffic island, checking behind if somebody's about to overtake you, let them go, do a big signal if necessary, hands back on the bars, check that people have responded to that, then move out through the centre of the lane, past the traffic islands, and then once you're past, again, check on your left, make sure there isn't a cyclist coming up on your inside, and move over to the left to allow people to, to overtake. Now, most people find that fairly straightforward, riding in this central position. It's got its own jargon in the cycle training world. It's known as the primary position. Don't worry, there's not a test later. But the faster the traffic gets and the heavier the traffic gets, the harder it is to move out into that central position. So you might find you can do it in 20. It gets harder at 30, harder still at 40, and maybe at 50 or 60 miles an hour, you can't move out. So what's your plan B going to be if you can't move out to the centre of the lane? Any ideas? Got some thoughts here on, yeah. And you, Paul's quite right. Yes, sometimes um, people do overtake on the, the right-hand side of the islands. Um, it's illegal. Uh, they're liable to get themselves three or six points if they do it, but you know what? They're keeping away from me, so they've got to live with the consequences. But if you've not been able to move out to the centre, any thoughts from anybody on what your best plan B might be? Yeah, Amory suggests pavement. So, what does the Highway Code say about riding our bikes on the pavement? Technically, the footway beside a road. Um, well, let's cut to the chase. If it's a footway, it's illegal to ride your bike on it. There's an urban myth that it's fine for children, but I think that's people getting confused with the age of criminal responsibility. So if you've got a child who's below the age of criminal responsibility, and I can't remember if that's 10 or 12, then they're not going to get a criminal conviction for riding on the pavement, but the police could still say, stop, don't do that. However, if the highways authorities put up a blue circular sign with a picture of a bike and a pedestrian, at that point, the pavement ceases being a footway and becomes a shared use walking and cycling facility, and then it's perfectly legal to ride your bike on there. So let's say um, you are riding your bike along here. There's two pedestrians. Um, if it's a shared use path, you do have to look after them. So what does that mean? What does looking after the pedestrians mean? Anybody, any thoughts on what you're going to do? Give way to them. Excellent. Yeah. So you could let them know you're coming. 
Um, you could ring your bell. Some uh, pedestrians get quite crabby if you ring a bell because they think you're telling them to get out of the way. I prefer to, to say friendly things. Yeah, good morning, hello, good afternoon, nice dog, assuming they've got a dog. So let's talk to people rather than ring bells at them. But it might still be that they don't get out of the way. Maybe they're hard of hearing. Maybe they've got their ear uh, phones in listening to an interesting um, podcast. Or maybe they're just having a bad day and don't want to get out of your way and want to chat to their friend. They don't have to get out of your way, it's their space. So what we need to do is slow down and wait in exactly the same way that if the motor vehicle comes up and there's oncoming traffic and they can't overtake they need to slow down and wait we need to do exactly the same as cyclists who could have guessed it's exactly the same um, and yes as Paul points out some people don't mind a bell others do um, so that's why I generally I, I prefer to, to talk to people I find I get get fewer crabbit replies that way you could return to the road if you've gone past the hazard but if you do that it's really important you don't just ride off the pavement into the road that you do check and make sure there isn't somebody coming it's that basic rule of moving make sure the space you're going to move into hasn't got somebody else moving into it and frankly that applies if you're pushing a trolley around the supermarket out jogging um riding a bike skiing ice skating in charge of a motor vehicle in charge of a boat flying an airplane check the space you're going to move into hasn't got somebody else moving into it, and then we have far fewer collisions. Now, the other situation where you might be sharing space with pedestrians is, is not the pavement beside the road, but a path that's away from a road. So let's say there's a path going through the woods here. There's not, there's not a road on either side of it. There's grass or trees next to it. Now, in Scotland, thanks to the Land Reform Scotland Act, it's perfectly legal on that path away from the road to walk, cycle, um, ride your horse if it floods you can paddle your canoe but you've got to look after the pedestrians in exactly the same way we've just talked about it slow down let them know you're coming and if you can't go past them safely wait down in England and Wales they don't have the Land Reform Scotland Act and there you have to find out whether that path is a footpath walking only or a bridleway walking cycling or horse riding so my top tip is do your cycling in Scotland we've got some of the best land access legislation in the world but it's dependent upon responsible access, so we do have to look after the people who are walking. Okay, moving on. Now, other signs you may well come across that, that do cause some confusion. So we've had the, um, this space is for people walking and cycling. Um, the red circular sign is no cycling. Now, you find a lot more of those in England and Wales because they have a lot more footpaths, but because of the Land Reform Scotland Act, we have paths that you can walk or um, cycle on or ride your horse so there's far fewer of those in Scotland if you do come across one as soon as you get off your bike and push it you become a pedestrian so at that point you can push your bike past that um, the rectangular cyclist dismount sign um, it's a rectangular sign and in the UK meanings of signs um, includes what shape they are so red circular prohibition you must not do it blue circular it's only for these people and rectangular is information so a cyclist dismount sign is not an order that you must get off your bike and walk it is advice and guidance and it's often used by highways officers at somewhere where they perceive that there's a risk for the cyclist so uh, near Stirling um, if you're riding out to Alloa on the old Alloa road there's a point where there's an old bridge the parapet is below modern design guidance so somebody's worked out that there is a theoretical risk that on a windy day a tall skinny cyclist could be blown over the parapet into the river so they put up a cyclist dismount sign to advise you that well there's a risk here so you better go off your bike and push so that basically it's the council trying to make sure they don't get sued for you ending up in the river but there's no requirement to get off your bike there however there are lots of pedestrians who don't realize that and think that this is an order and if you do carry on riding you might get the victim Eldrew type waving their wing, their walking stick screaming at you that you're being a naughty cyclist and you haven't followed the order to get off your bike it only becomes a problem really if they start trying to stick their walking stick through the spokes of your wheel so just be aware there's no legal requirement but you might end up with cravat bad tempered pedestrians some of whom may take on vigilante action to be fair to Stirling Council, they've removed uh, the vast majority of the cyclist dismount signs because they were causing that conflict and have replaced them with share with care signs, which I think is a much better um, message um, and 
And so if you are having problems with these signs, it's worth flagging these up to highways offices that that's uh, a much nicer alternative. Now, going back to this concept that I mentioned about- Can, the, the can you just vote. interrupt there and- uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yep. Louise asked, I thought you said it was illegal to cycle on the normal paths. However, when the police helped me deliver cycle training, they say there's no, no law against it. Can you just clarify that point about cycling on paths? Yeah, so if, hang on, if you have uh, the, what most people call the pavement, but that's not the technical language, the highways officers call that the footway. If you look in the highway code, it says you must not ride on the pavement, the footway. It's the same rule that actually makes it illegal to drive your car on there because it, it dates back so far, they're both considered to be carriages. So it's illegal. Uh, if you look in the highway code, it says the maximum fine is something like a thousand pounds. It's very rarely is that uh, that thousand pound fine given, um, but lots of big cities, certainly in England, uh, give out fixed penalty notices. I think leaving Manchester in London, the police will give out a lot of fixed penalty notices, £60 fine for people riding bikes on the pavement when it's classified as a footway. But lots of local authorities, their favourite um, cycling infrastructure is to just take the pavement and stick up the blue sign. And at that point, as soon as there's one of those, it's perfectly legal to ride your bike on the pavement. It ceases being a footway. Now, there was guidance that the Home Office issued to police forces in England and Wales, I don't know if it was issued in Scotland, that said that, that, that those fixed penalty notices were designed to be given to cyclists who were riding recklessly and not looking after pedestrians and putting pedestrians at risk. And it wasn't designed for cyclists who were riding responsibly and had taken to the pavement due to fear of motor vehicles. So that was guidance. Um, I know it was issued in England and Wales. I don't know if it's been issued in Scotland, but the simple answer is if it's a pavement that's still a footway, it is illegal. If it's a pavement and it's got a blue circular sign, then it is okay, it is legal. Um, now, you do sometimes get police officers who are confused by all this. Traffic officers are normally excellent because they have done a huge amount of additional training on road traffic act and laws but a lot of the regular police officers don't get much more training uh, than somebody who just passes their driving test so there is a huge amount of confusion but that is the legal situation um, and again in scotland any path that's away from a road perfectly legal to ride on um, in england wales you need to find out whether it's a footpath or bridleway Oh, and there's some really bizarre ones that in Stirling, outside the Baptist Church, the path that goes past the Baptist Church towards Oxfam, they haven't put up the blue circular site with the pedestrian and the bike because that was considered to be road clutter. So what they've done is they put paving slabs. There's a few paving slabs with pictures of bikes and pictures of pedestrians. Very subtle. Very few people know they're there. Again, it's perfectly legal to ride along there. You've got to look after the pedestrians, but again, you will get a lot of very crabby um, pedestrians who don't realise it's legal and get, get quite angry. So that, that's the, the legal situation there. Um, frankly, it's a complete mess, but that's where we are. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, now, this concept of riding in the centre of the lane when it's not safe for somebody to overtake you, this isn't just some yeah, cycle trainer from Stirling who's come up with this. This is Department for Transport Think Road Safety Campaign, and they're saying cyclists ride central on narrow roads. All sorts of things that can make a ride narrow. In this part of the world, it could be it's a single track road, in which case ride central when you get to a passing place, move into the passing place and allow the traffic to go by. Or it could be something as simple as there's a parked car on this side of the road, which means that this car can't overtake using the other side of the road. That's narrowed the road, so in that circumstance, ride central. As a cyclist, if you perceive there is not room for a safe overtake that looks like that one, then ride central to discourage the dangerous overtake. As I said, 
known as the primary position. When you're riding over to the side and you've sort of opened the door and said to people, okay, that's known as the secondary position. But honestly, I'm not going to test you on this. Now, it's not just cyclists who are vulnerable. Here's a lady taking her dog out for a walk. Um, there is no footway beside this road. This is at the back of Canvas Bar and Paul Mays Road. Uh, there's a path just behind where the photo was taken. Very popular with dog walkers. They come along the path and they come down the road. And when they get to the footway, they carry on the footway. So if you're driving down here, um, it's a national speed limit road. Um, so that's 60 miles an hour for a car, 50 miles an hour for a small van, 40 miles an hour for an HGV. But that's the limit. It's not a target. There's, if she was just around the corner, there's no way coming down here at 60 miles an hour would be an appropriate speed. The highway code says you should drive at a speed that means you can stop well within the distance you can see to be clear. And at this point, um, you need to be going a lot less than 60 miles an hour. And then when you do get to this lady, again, you need to be giving her the space we saw in that first slide. So you need to cross over to the side of the road. But it's a corner, so that's not a good place to overtake. Again, this is a situation where you just need to slow down and wait. She may well step into a driveway and then you can carry on your way. But while she's in the road, we need to slow down, give her space, and if necessary, we need to wait. We've now got a wee video. This has been recorded by a cyclist who's got a, a camera on their helmet. So wherever they look, we see what they see. Um, initially, I'd say they're about that meter out position, just out of the damp patch. That also keeps them out of the puddles, which is also really important. You don't want to ride through puddles, not because you want to stay dry, but because the puddle's hiding how deep that road defect is. You don't know whether that's a few millimetres deep or several inches deep. And there was a tragic incident down Salisbury Plain a few years ago. An army officer who'd, who'd got a desk job, he was riding a bike to and from work to keep his fitness going. And one evening he went through a puddle. It wasn't a few millimetres, it was several inches. That put him down on the ground and he was run over and killed by the following traffic. So as a cyclist, don't ride through puddles. As a driver, if I see a cyclist going through a puddle, I'm immediately thinking, well, they're upright now, but they could be down on the ground any moment. How close to them am I? Do I need to drop back? Can I avoid them if they go down? So sometimes as a driver, you need to put your superhero cape on and, and provide the protection. So I'm going to run the video. While it's running, I want you to think two things. Uh, one, when do you first see the traffic island? And then when it's run through, we'll talk about what the cyclist could have done differently and what the driver could have done differently. So the cyclist has looked round, and now they're looking down. Here comes the lorry. There's the traffic island. Cyclist looks round again. Now at this point, is the lorry actually going much faster than the person on the bike? No, the cyclist is catching them up. So that overtake achieved absolutely nothing. So if you watch this a lot, you can tell that the cyclist starts out a metre out, but they quickly use that metre space. They move in by the kerb, they get onto the brakes. But the back of that wagon is still horribly close to the cyclist. Um, anybody got any ideas in the chat section on what they could have done differently as a cyclist in that situation? Or if anybody wants to unmute and and say what they think they could have done. Yep, Paul, you've nailed it. Um, the cyclist could have moved into the middle of the lane. Yep, Louise, you've said to the same. Not the middle of the road, remember, it's the middle of the lane. But again, I've watched this a lot, and I think they needed to start that manoeuvre a lot earlier. Um, I think they need to be looking further up the road to see that traffic island, to then look behind and see whether they've got time to move out or whether in fact they need to bail out. And I'm constantly scanning at that sort of time, looking for drop curbs to be able to bail out onto the pavement and stop. I'm, I'm not very good at bunny hopping at speed, so I don't want to try and bunny hop onto the pavement and get it wrong. But if you see that traffic island a lot earlier, it gives you time to look. Sometimes signaling is enough to make the drivers back off. Um, some people are looking no further than the thing that's immediately in front of them, which is your back wheel. The point you start signaling, they go, what's, well, what's going on here? If that doesn't work, sometimes I'll even point at the uh, at the traffic island. Then they, they they look up, oh, it's a traffic island, and back off. But if they still keep going for it, then I've got time to bail out. So I think looking further up the road may well have helped 
the cyclist in that situation. And it may also well have been what the driver needed to be doing. If they'd only been looking at the cyclist, they may have gone cyclist, slow, going to overtake. They could have been halfway through that and realised, oh, there's a traffic island, and they're moving in, holding their breath, hoping that, that they're not going to take the cyclist out. So I think if both parties had been looking further up the road, both would have seen the traffic island earlier. Both could have managed that, and we wouldn't have had that inc incident. You can read a lot of advanced cycling manuals, advanced motorcycling manuals, advanced driving manuals. A lot of the time, the advice boils down to a few basic things, and look further up the road is one of those basic things. And then you see the hazards earlier, and you can manage them earlier. You sometimes get people complain, oh, that ca something came out of nowhere. No, things don't come out of nowhere. They come out of places you're not looking. Paul's made a really good point about um, drop curbs. Yeah, you need to try and cross them as close to 90 degrees as possible. Um, same as tramways and level crossings. Um, curbs, rail tra tracks, cross them close to 90 degrees. Otherwise, that can put you down on the ground. Um, I may suggest letting them pass if they feel they're close. I mean, yeah, that cyclist let that wagon go past, but... Um, they very nearly had their arm ripped off by that. You need to, to look for those traffic islands so you can manage. And if that, that vehicle is coming through, then you need to be able to bail out. Stop, get out of the way, but not just keep going and end up with the back of those trailers um, getting really close to you. So drivers, cyclists, look as far up the road as you can and then plan to manage the hazards that are there. Now, this slide was uh, taken at a cycle show. Um, it was all stands with new bikes and bike equipment but the police got a stand and they got one of these big quarry lorries in and they're explaining to, to cyclists that this yellow area marks out what they were calling the blind spot they're saying don't go to this black area there's a good chance the driver cannot see you and they're inviting cyclists up into the cab to look and to Boris it's a horrible job I'm glad I don't have to do it um, you've got to check that mirror, that mirror, top mirror, that mirror, that mirror, side mirror in the window. Then there's a, a warning for light. You've got to, by the time you've done that, you've got to do it all again. Um, so the police are saying, do not go into this area. There's a good chance the driver does not know you're there. Now, if you think about it, this area also perfectly maps over a zebra crossing. And there was an awful incident in Birmingham about four or five years ago where the driver had stopped because he'd seen the pedestrian waiting here. The pedestrian crossed over and walked up the pavement. The driver never saw the wee girl who was coming up the pavement in the blind spot and had started crossing. And the driver moved forward and ran over the wee girl called Hope Fennel and killed her. So do not go into this blind spot. If you're coming up the pavement, go all the way forward, make eye contact with the driver, make sure they've seen you, make sure they know what you're doing, and then step in front as a driver it's also important to remember that well you're controlling where your blind spot goes so it's always good to stop short of zebra crossings so that you can still see what's going on there uh, got some chat here yeah keeping well away from hgvs yeah and it is it is a big area so top tip keep out of that area and be very careful if you're coming up inside one of these at a, a zebra crossing. Now, this is a very common feature. We find them at traffic lights. Um, there's several of these in Stirling. Um, it's an advanced stop line that creates a cycle box. The idea is that the cyclists are there in front of everybody else. The lights change. The cyclists go through the junction and then everybody else can see them. And there's a, there's a handy cycle lane that enables you to, to filter through to get to the advanced stop box. Does the size and shape of that cycle facility remind anybody of anything? Yep, and lots of people are spotting that it's the same as the blind spot on the HGV. So if you're there first and the vehicles come up behind you, then um, hopefully the drivers are going to remember you're there. But if I was coming down this road now and there's a long queue of vehicles at the lights, a long queue tells me the lights have been red for a while. And the next thing that happens after the lights have been red is that they go green. There's no way I want to be coming up this cycle lane as the lights go green. 
these drivers may well not know that I'm there because I'm in their blind spot. They start moving, I'm moving. If I'm going straight on and they're turning left, it's not going to end well. So if I were to arrive here with a long queue like that, and I think the lights are about to change, I'm going to wait behind that red van at the back. I'm not going to stop in the cycle lane and invite somebody else to come up and put me in the blind spot. I'll wait behind that red truck and then ride up between the brake lights, behind the number plate, in the flow of the traffic. Now, it's fine not to use the cycle lane. Cycle lanes are there to make your journey safer, but the use of them will depend upon your skills and experience. That's what the highway code says. So this is one of these times when you need to have the skills and experience to know that that is not necessarily the safest place for you to be. Now, again, there's a lot of confusion because this cycle lane is a dashed line, which means it's an advisory cycle lane. Now, that's not advisory that cyclists are in it. That's advisory that motor vehicles are out of it. If it were a solid white line, that type of cycle lane is known as a mandatory cycle lane. But again, it's not mandatory that cyclists are in it. It's mandatory that motor vehicles are out of it. But those, that terminology causes a lot of confusion, even with some highways officers. But um, you do not have to use that. If you perceive that it's safer to be out of it, then you are absolutely legal and fine to do that. Now, if I were to arrive here and I knew the junction really well, I could see traffic's moving one way and I know that actually this queue isn't going to move because the traffic's going to move for another way, I could filter to the front. Um, if there wasn't oncoming traffic here, I might be safe to overtake on the outside where drivers can see me more easily in their, their mirror on that side. Um, filtering on either side is perfectly legal. The highway code says in slow moving and stationary traffic, be aware of bikes and motorbikes who may be passing on either side. It goes on to say, um, in slow moving and stationary traffic, uh, be aware of, of bikes and motorbikes who are filtering and give them space to do so. So the highway code, not only is it legal, the highway code advises drivers to facilitate it. However, again, be aware, there are lots of drivers who don't realise that. There are some who think that it is illegal and some who will take vigilante action as you're filtering will move their vehicle in to block you off. There's also the issue if you're filtering up the inside, if there's a passenger who's getting amped because they're late and then decide to, oh, it's all right, I'll walk and they open the door without looking and you get hit by a door as you're coming up. So filtering, legal, but high risk, be aware when you're doing it. Now, this design has killed so many cyclists in London that what they're starting to do there now is to introduce a smaller set of lights here with bike symbols on and they go green first that gets the cyclist through the junction then the main traffic lights go green and then the motor vehicles go through they're known as early release lights um lots gone in in london there's one set gone in in edinburgh in leith and there's a couple of sets gone in in glasgow there's a set near calvin grove park on Socky hall street so i imagine they will become more um, popular and again if uh, you're aware anywhere of junctions being redesigned that's definitely something to feed into consultations um, it's really not a good idea to have people on bikes and people in motor vehicles doing conflicting movements it's just building in um, conflict the norm in Denmark yes I, I understand that the, the concept of the advanced stop box did come from Europe where they've always used that separate set of lights, but we introduced advanced stop lines and cycle boxes, I don't know, 15 years ago in this country and thought we'd do it on the cheap without the second set of lights. Now we've killed so many cyclists, we're starting to get the lights uh, introduced. It's a shame that it happened that way. Now, as I said, it's not just people on bikes who are vulnerable road users. If you're walking along the pavement here, and there's this large vehicle parked there do not walk between the vehicle and that wall especially if the engine's running the driver will not know you're there and if they if they move the vehicle you're just going to get crushed in this situation what i do is i'd stop here i call across to the contractors over here and i become their problem it's up to them to escort me round the corner safely they need to be running a safe site that's not just safe for themselves that's safe for members of the public so at this point stop and ask them to escort you to your destination. Um, the picture down here, this is one of these unintended consequences, it's when Stirling High School is being built, um, the primary school is just around the corner, and the planning condition said that when the primary school started and finished, there couldn't be movements on and off the high school site, 
and the result was the drivers of these big vehicles were just parked up on the pavements waiting for the barrier to go up. So any moment now there's going to be 200 primary school children, 200 primary school children coming out and trying to walk along the pavement. They can't, they've got to walk in the road. In this situation, I would suggest it's entirely appropriate to dial 101 and ask for the police to come and assist, especially if the drivers um, will not cooperate and move. And if you if you have young people, children, uh, it's certainly uh, I would empower them, make them make them realise that there are times when it is entirely appropriate to ask the police to come and help. Now this is an articulated truck, so the cab is moving independently of the trailer. At this point, the cab started to move, so the mirrors are now pointing at the trailer. The driver cannot see any of these people here. There's a there's a video on YouTube. You can see where they they go into the cab with a camera and look in the mirrors you can't see anything the camera gets out looks and then there's all these people these big trucks have to move to the right to be able to turn left they um the, the wheels here will will come over about where this green cyclist is if they didn't move over they'd be driving over the pavement so they open up what looks like an inviting gap do not go into that gap be you a pedestrian a cyclist frankly don't even drive a small car in there on YouTube, you can find there's a couple of videos of these big trucks pushing small cars, um, Ford Fiestas, Fiat 500, sideways along the road. They've got inside, they've got caught, and the driver's no idea that this small car is there. That's how big these blind spots are. Do not go into that space. But there's two ways the cyclists could have got there. One is the lorry was there first and they've ridden up inside. Do not do that. The other is the cyclist was there first and the lorry is driven up next to them and put them in the blind spot, which again is why we recommend you don't stop at junctions in the gutter here, but stop in the centre of the lane, that primary position to encourage people to wait behind you. But let's say uh, it's all gone horribly pear-shaped, you're having a bad day, you're that cyclist in green, that lorry's there. At this point, don't bother trying to wave to the driver, don't bother trying to shout to the driver, bail out, get onto the pavement because the back wheels of that truck are going to be on top of you very soon. And if the high authority have put those metal railings around to keep the pedestrians out, ditch the bike, jump over the railings. You probably haven't got time to manhandle your bike over those railings before the wheels are on top of you. Ditch the bike, jump over the railings and save your life. And again, even if a highways officer has painted a cycle lane in the gutter at a junction like this, do not use it. You need to be waiting in the center of the lane to encourage people to wait behind you. You come up to the junction, you check it's clear, you turn left or right, then the next vehicle comes up, they check it's clear, they go left or right, and we're going through the junction one at a time in the way it's been designed to be used. Remember these cycle lanes are there to make your journey safer, in theory, use of them depends upon your skills and confidence, and this is one of these times you need to have the skills and confidence to know that that is poor practice to be waiting there and you need to be waiting in the centre of the lane and then when you get home write to your local council and ask them to stop doing this. Uh, this is an alloa, it's on the cycle route between alloa and Stirling. Another video, um, this cyclist has got a recumbent bike which is why you can see the feet in front of them. We'll let this run and we'll have a quick look at what their positioning is coming up to uh, a large vehicle. So you can see them here, they're in the centre of that lane coming out towards that truck between the brake lights, just like I described. And this guy in yellow, don't do that. Let's have a look at how close the wheels of that lorry are to this cyclist. They're just brushing past his wheel. At this point, the guy is recording saying, don't do that, don't go inside these big trucks. That's how cyclists die. And he's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now at this point, the guy is recording and rather than being directly behind in centre, move slide to the right so the driver of the truck's got a chance to see him in his mirror there. And the guy in yellow is a Darwin Award. Do not go up inside these big trucks. The driver does not know you're there. If you do move slightly to the right to enable the driver to see you in their mirrors, just be careful you then don't open up a gap on your left that if there's an impatient driver behind you in a small car, Fiat 500 or a smart car goes, oh, there's space for me, and they dive into that space and take your left tip off. So check behind. If the vehicle's too big to fit in that gap, you're probably okay moving over. But if you get the impression that they're impatient and they're in a small vehicle and you think they might go in there, then remain in the center of the lane in that primary position. But don't go up inside these big vehicles. The driver won't know you're there. 
and he won't feel you if he crushes you. Another video, this cyclist got two cameras, one pointing forwards, one pointing backwards. We have the rear view first, cyclist is in the advanced stop box, the light changes, everybody moves off. This is in London where they paint a lot of cycle lanes blue. Initially, the cycle lane is over in the bus lane, which is also common in a lot of cities, certainly in London and Edinburgh, you find that a lot. But at the next junction, the bus lane is going to go left and the cycle route goes straight on. So the blue paint is going to move from the bus lane into the going straight on lane. So you have to look behind, look for a gap in the traffic and then merge over into the going straight on and left turning lane. This is a waste paper collection lorry. This is a lady in yellow. She's in the blue paint going straight on. And nice bike handling skills by the lady in yellow to avoid being run over. Let's watch the slow motion version and see if we can work out what's happening here. So the brakes are on on the waste paper collection. The lady's made it into the blue paint. She's going straight on. The brakes are on. The brakes are on. The brakes are on. They put her into the blind spot about now and then signal left and turn left across her. And amazing bike handling skills to avoid going under that truck. Now, as a result of that video, the driver got three points and all the fine for careless driving. But what could the cyclist have done differently? And what could the driver have done differently? Anybody, any thoughts on what the cyclist could have done differently? Either unmute and let us know or type away on the chat. Anybody? Okay. So she could have waited till the lorry gone past before pulling out, but if you look at the point at which the lorry goes past, she's already in the middle of the junction. So I don't know that, that would have worked. I mean, in terms of the lorry going past, she'd have, she'd have been in the bus lane, not be go over. And Michelle, yes, the best practice guidance here is that the cyclist should have been in the middle of the lane in that primary position to discourage somebody from overtaking and turning across but i've watched this lots and she's already had to move from the blue paint in the bus lane to the blue paint here and now we're saying she needs to move out the blue paint there into the so from the blue paint into the center of the lane and i don't think she had time I think she needed to move out of the bus lane before the blue paint had moved over here in order to then have time to get to the centre of the lane. And again, it's just because a highways officer has painted a cycle lane or blue paint, red paint, it doesn't mean it's your safest option. Sometimes you need to be out of those cycle lanes in order to keep yourself safe. And I think she needed to move out of that bus lane and cycle lane way before the blue paint moved so that she could have time to get to the centre of that lane. In terms of what the driver could have done differently, well, obviously not overtake and turn left. Um, and I do wonder, it's a waste paper collection already, they're doing pickups, lots of different places. And I'm wondering if the driver is using a sat nav. Now, I sometimes use my phone as a sat nav. And what I've noticed is that sometimes it will tell me to turn left when I'm in the middle of a junction, way too late. And I'm wondering if maybe, maybe it's his passenger, maybe his boss is sat next to him and the boss has been going, oh, left! And instead of checking that there's nobody in the space they're going to turn into, it's just signal left and turn because either the sat nav or his boss has gone left. So I think there's something here about not being intimidated by your boss or your sat nav and accepting that if you've not managed to check, if you've not done, yeah, look, signal before you do your manoeuvre, if you've not checked there's nobody there, then keep going. Your sat nav will recalculate. Your boss might swear a bit, but they'll find another route. But don't turn into a space if you've not checked that there's anybody there. And again, as a cyclist, this junction looks absolutely horrible. I think if I had to do this every day, I might be checking out a cycle route planner to see if there's another route I could take. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. But if I could find a, a route that didn't involve this junction, I think it would reduce my stress levels massively. And to be fair to Transport for London, they have redesigned this junction since this video was done. And there's now those separate cycle lights. So you never get cyclists going straight on when drivers are turning left. They've removed that conflict movement. But there are plenty of other junctions where you still do get conflict movements. Um, in Stirling, 
just past the police office. If you turn left out of the police office, head down towards the council offices. The cycle lane is encouraging you to be on the left. If you're going straight on, you're now to the left of people who are turning left. Exactly this situation. You've been suckered into a, a position of conflict that you don't want to be in. Now, this is Dunblane um, by the police office. There's a hashed area here to remind cyclists to keep far enough away from the parked car so that if a door opens, you cannot be hit by the parked car. On an average year in the UK, two cyclists, one or two cyclists a year are killed being hit by car doors. Right, never ride close enough that you can be hit. Hundreds of other cyclists left with life changing injuries. So this is really good practice. And again, this is best practice guidance from the Department for Transport Cyclists via doors width from parked cars. Um, there's a consultation on the uh, changes to highway code and one of the things they're talking about is telling people inside cars to use the hand furthest from the door to open the door so that that twists them around so they can see what's coming. They're going to call it the Dutch reach apparently. However, I wouldn't rely on drivers and passengers doing that. I would ride far enough away so that if they do open it, you cannot be hit. The next photograph is taken about 200 metres down the road. Here's the cycle lane, there's the parked cars, where's the door danger zone now? So the door danger zone is still there but it's now the cycle lane. So do not ride close enough to parked cars that if a door open it can hit you. You don't want to ride on the dashed line, you're out of the door zone but you can now see that that lorry will go past and take your arm off or a bus, as Paul says, will take your arm off. So the best practice guidance here would be to ride in the centre of the lane here in that primary position that we keep talking about. So you're now riding in the centre of the lane. There's what appears to be a perfectly good cycle lane next to you. What might the driver behind you be doing at this point? Yeah, hooting. Um, screaming and what you need to remember is that just because they're getting angry you don't have to get angry they're the ones who are going to die of stress related illnesses in their 30s because they can't cope with somebody riding a bike but if they end up 25 mil from your back wheel and they're revving the engine at that point excuse me I would pull in stop and get rid of them it's better to have angry dangerous people in front of you than behind you um, Stop ideally between the bonnet and boot, so that if a door opens it doesn't hit you. Get rid of them, take a deep breath. <sighs> Remember you're having a better life than they are. Check it's clear and as soon as it's clear, carry on riding down that lane. But do not let people bully you into riding in the door danger zone. And as a driver, if I'm driving down here and I see a cyclist who's been suckered into riding the door danger zone, I'm immediately thinking, well, they're up right now, but they could be down on the ground in front of me any moment. So this is not a good time to overtake them. So it's time to put your superhero cape on and you ride along behind them until they're clear of all the parked cars. And then when it's safe, then do an overtake. And then when you get home, write to your local councillors and ask them, please, to stop doing this. To be fair, Stern Council have not repainted this in about eight years and it's very faint now. But there are plenty of others just like this. Uh, all the way into Perth, over in Helensburgh, there's, there's a lot like this. Um, so do not ride in the door danger zone. And drivers, if you see a cyclist there, that's not a good time to overtake. Yep. Yeah. Now, a bit further on, we get the hashed area back again, but this is just off the traffic lights. By the time you get into this cycle lane, that ends in a curb across there. You've got to get out. So by the time you get in, you're looking, you're signaling, you're moving out. You may as well, for the for sort of four car lengths, just stay out with the traffic, get through. And then once you're around the roundabout, it's a dual carriageway and people can overtake you. So don't get yourself into a cycle lane that you're immediately going to have to get out of. And there, that's the end of the theory. If we were going to do a theory, uh, sorry, a practical session now, um, we would go and check our bikes. Uh, we talk about um, bikes, clothing, helmets and equipment. Uh, in terms of your bike, always make sure you've got two working brakes. That's a requirement for highway code. Every time I ride my bike, I check both brakes, uh, check there's air in your tyres, check that the, the gears are working. Um, 
these truck drivers are about to do training. Some of them have got a helmet, some of them don't have a helmet. There's no legal requirement in the UK to wear a helmet when you're riding a bike. The Highway Code says you should wear one, not you must wear one. There's some evidence that people wearing helmets take more risks and then have more accidents. There's some evidence that if you are riding a helmet, you get less space from passing cars. If you don't have one, you get more space from passing cars. And the research subjects had a long wig on, got no space at all. So there are advantages to having a helmet. It will offer some protection to part of your body. There are disadvantages. It might make you more reckless and more likely to have an accident, or it might make drivers more reckless and more likely to hit you. So whenever I'm doing training, I'm quite happy for people to make an informed choice about whether they wear a helmet or not. Uh, the employers uh, these guys work for has insisted they'll wear high vis. Again, that's not a legal requirement. The highway code says you should wear something bright. At night, you must have lights white at the front, red at the back, and a rear red reflector. Flashing lights are legal on bicycles, um, but there's no requirement to have them fitted to the bike during the day. Um, there's various reflectors that come when you buy a bike. There is, that's a trading standard regulation, not a, a Road Traffic Act regulation. So they have to be there when the bike's sold, but not when it's in use. So the reflector that must be there is the rear red one. And if you buy a new bike, you've got to have pedal reflectors. If you've got an old bike that predates the regulations, you don't have to have pedal reflectors. So again, crazily um, complicated rules, but the basic rule is at night, as soon as the sun's gone down, you've got to have lights. The high vis, be careful. There's a lot of road safety um, posters. Be bright, be seen. And the reflectors are good at night. On a dull day, the um, fluorescent may help you, but on a bright day, that may camouflage you. And there's a school crossing patroller run over a few years ago in Portsmouth, Waterlooville. Uh, December morning, bright low sun. He was wearing a yellow jacket, yellow trousers. He was run over and killed. And the police accident investigator said his fluorescent clothing made him blend into the bright, bright background. So just be aware that you're not um, being encouraged to wear something that's going to camouflage you. Now, the good news is if you'd like to do some practical training, there's an offer from Cycling Scotland at the moment for free adult training. It's a, a two and a half hour practical session. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, um, email me, um, ping me a message on chat. You can get me via my website, sterlingcycletraining.com, or give me a call. Um, that's the end of the presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them, either um, turn your mute off and ask the question or or type a uh, type a message uh, a question on the chat but thank you very much for coming along um there we are chris has just put the website up there so if you want to book some free training while the weather's good i get in there quick um that's that's a free offer from cycling scotland at the moment but thank you all very much and i look forward to your questions um, while people are possibly typing in there as well i'll, I'll just uh mentioned that we also on Saturday we have a bicycle maintenance event happening in conjunction with Recycle Bike um, where we will start off with a, um, a, a pre-ride check, an M check on, on the whole bike and then go through brakes and gears and changing inner tubes and tyres and all that. Um, so check that out on our website too. Um, any particular lights you would recommend for your bike? Um, that's a good question. In uh, in urban areas, I like flashing lights because they help you stand out. In rural areas, it's recommended to have a steady white light because there's no street lights, and otherwise you just yeah the the road in front of you it's like a strobe it's on and it's off. There's some incredibly powerful uh, lights that are available now. Um, yeah, twenty years ago you had never ever ready you know, plastic light that you needed new batteries in it every other day for it to you know, do more than a, a dim yellow gleam these days there's some incredibly powerful lights be aware there's some imported ones who are they're not road traffic designed they're you, know, you, you get hill walkers using them like they light up an entire hillside a mountain bikers like them for the same reason but be very careful if you use them on road that you're not blinding the oncoming traffic my son bought a set we set them up in his handlebars. And I, I, I said to him, right, stand by the garage and I'll dip them down until you're not blinded. And effectively, I had the light pointing at the front wheel before he went, oh, that's OK, I'm not blinded. 
So just be careful. They're great lights, but you do have to make sure you're not blinding other people with them. And it's always good to have a backup spare set because your batteries always die at the most unfortunate times. Yeah, I've, I've got some uh, USB charge of charging ones, which are great because I can plug them into the computer as I'm as I'm working. So, and then I know I've got battery power in there, but it's only great if you do remember to charge them up. <laughs> I, I do sometimes forget, and I always always worries me when I don't. I take the most indirect route, but it's the most off the road route if I uh, haven't got my batteries. Yeah, no, I've just got a couple of. You can get some, I think they're called frog lights. They're, they're really small, um, run on a, a sort of um, hearing aid size battery. Um, you can hold two of them in your hand. And I've just got a couple of those in, in, in my day sack as sort of emergency backup lights. Um, it's, it's always worth, worth having, a, having a backup, absolutely. 